you will listen to an interview about food quality and the fact that some of the food you buy, for example apples and spinach, have absolutely no nutrients in it. Even if you buy organic, even if you buy local, you're going to learn more about the immense challenges and opportunities of introducing quality back into the food system. Welcome to another episode of Investing in Regenerative Agriculture, Investing as if the Planet Mattered, a podcast show where I talk to the pioneers in the regenerative food and agriculture space to learn more on how to put our money to work to regenerate soil, people, local communities and ecosystems while making an appropriate and fair return. Why am I focused on soil and regeneration? Because so many of the pressing issues we face today have their roots in how we treat our land, grow our food and what we eat. And it's time that we as investors, big and small and consumers, start paying much more attention to the dirt slash soil underneath our feet. Before we get started, I've been recording these interviews next to my day job and I will definitely continue to do so and release about an episode a month. But at the same time, I would love to take this further, share more interviews. There are many more stories to share on investing in regenerative food and agriculture. More depth, improve the quality, maybe even doing some video series. So I started a Patreon community, which makes it easy to support creators like myself. If these podcasts have been of value to you, and if you have the means, I invite you to support me and make this happen. For more information, please find the link to my Patreon account in the description below. And now, without further ado, the interview. Enjoy! Welcome to another interview. Today I'm interviewing Greg Schumacher co-founder of Teak Origin, a biochemistry data company located in Boston. They enable people throughout the global food system to accurately answer critical questions like how is food changing throughout the supply chain and are we getting what we're paying for? As most people know, I'm fascinated about the link between healthy soils, healthy produce, healthy gut, healthy people, and especially if that leads to healthy ecosystems. So I think we have a lot to discuss. Welcome, Greg. Thank you for having me. Nice to talk to you. To ask the personal question, what brings you into the food and agriculture space? Oh, boy. Well, I kind of stumbled into this space. I, uh, I'm not a farmer, not a chef. I don't have a food science background at all. I uh, was living in, in China with my family on and off for a number of years, but several years ago, and started just thinking about you know what we were eating, what I was putting into my body and what I was feeding my family. And sometimes it would have odd effects and wouldn't know why it would be so random and you know sometimes quite upsetting and so i thought you know hey it's a, uh, we live in a world now where the answers to any question seems like they're just a few keystrokes away and so i started doing a little research into you know what am i eating and and uh quickly discovered man when you start asking that question it just opens up pandora's box and there aren't really any simple answers in fact there's just lots more questions and so it became something that at the time was extremely frustrating for me. And, and then it all of a sudden, I don't know, some moment in time uh, happened and it became sort of my my life's work or my passion. I wanted to try to figure this out, you know, as, as stubborn as I might be. And so ever since then, I have been all in on trying to understand food and food systems. And that led you to co-found a biochemistry company. Uh, can you explain a bit how you got to, to start Teak Origin? And I mean, it's a, it's a long story, but we'd love to know a bit about the background. And then obviously we're going to talk about where you're now and where you're going, but let's see how you got to where you're now. When you realize, okay, it's not, it's not just, I'm not just a consumer. I actually want to work and dedicate a lot of my time into the space. What did you do? Well, so I blame my daughter who was 14 years old at the time. And she knew that I had an interest in this now and sort of, you know, my new obsession was now food safety and understanding food. And I just coincidentally happened to be working alongside Tesco, manufacturing some consumer products, including Android phones in and around China. And so I had that sort of lens on anyway of making products. And my daughter came to me one day with this idea that she'd seen on the Internet. And it was a Kickstarter campaign for a product called Sayo and Sayo maybe lots of your listeners already know it, it's been around for a while now, is essentially a handheld spectrometer. It looks like a key fob, essentially shines light at organic material. It connects to a, a device, a phone, uh, essentially via Bluetooth. And the idea is that it would scan this light, go up to a database, and it would return an answer to say, hey, here's what this is. So, hey, I'd never seen anything like that before. I thought it was really cool. 
my longtime colleague who I, I work very closely with now for decades, I shared it with him. And we said, wow, this is something really worth looking at. And again, because we had the lens of making Android phones and other consumer devices, it sort of fit in along with this desire to understand food. So we looked into that a little bit deeper and we quickly realized, hey, this is a great concept, but technically or scientifically speaking, hey, there's a lot of holes in it because it sort of relied on consumers to crowdsource you know, the data, upload, hey, here's what I think I'm about to scan. And then I scan something and those two bits of information go up into the cloud. And so there's a lot of room for error. Obviously, I have to know what I'm scanning. I could game the system. I could be wrong. I could call it an apple and really it's a pear. And so it was a great idea, but you know, it could be better. So what we thought is, hey, because we're working alongside this massive food company, what if you could take the same concept, but you instead of relying on consumers or the crowd to create these data sets, what if you could do it in, in the supply chain? What if you could do it either on the farm or at least closer to the farm and then move it forward to the consumer? And so basically that's the, the, the sort of the journey we set out on to build something like that. And we actually built a number of prototypes into a phone and to a phone case that worked, believe it or not. But what we quickly discovered is, one, there probably wasn't a market for that. And two, even if there was a market for that, there were no referential data sets or there was no contextual information that you could access, even if you could build you know, an instrument that would do what we were hoping to do and others were hoping to do as well. So basically, there wasn't a way of I'm scanning my Apple and then a device or software or whatever um, interface you use could tell you this is good or this is better than another Apple you scanned maybe yesterday or another one you're scanning today. There was no context to the data that the scanner could provide. Yeah, that's right. So there's a lot of devices out there today and there's a lot of AI based companies that sort of make claim that the technology is able to do that, but it's impossible. Today, there is only one way to truly determine, you know, information about that apple, and that is to test it in a lab. You have to send it off and it has to be analyzed chemically. And once it's analyzed chemically, then you can say, okay, well, here's what's actually happening inside of that apple. But without doing that, there are no magic devices or magic algorithms that could tell you that information without accessing that chemical analysis. Do you think they will be there at some point? So that's what we've created with Teak Origin. So essentially what we've done, and we can go back in time and talk a little bit more about how we got from that stage to today, but essentially what we figured out now, and it took us the good part of five or six years to do so, is that, so we'll take a food, and let's just stick with apples for the moment. And we'll say, okay, we have an apple. There may be a 200 different things that you can measure about that apple, but in reality, there's probably 10 things that matter the most. Hey, the moisture content and sugar and vitamin C and malic acid, maybe some antioxidants. But the other 190 plus things don't really matter. And so we'll take those handful of important things that matter. So they, they don't really matter for, let's say, the Tesco, or they don't really matter for me as a, as a consumer, or they don't matter because they're connected to the others and the others function as a, as a proxy. Yeah, a little bit of all of the above. They're just, you know, so if you think about Apple, hey, I, it's important to me as it's crisp. It's either sweet or tart, depending on my taste. I'm eating it for most likely health purposes. So I, I want there to be some vitamins in there. But there are probably some obscure minerals in there that one, almost, you know, are, are hard to detect. And two, maybe don't really actually make a difference. So we had to start somewhere. So we say, you know, again, for most foods, it's anywhere between eight and 20 individual things that we say, here's what's important food. So we'll take that apple and then we'll, we'll create what we call a critical composition profile. So here's what is important from a supply chain and here's what's important from a consumer standpoint. And here are the individual components that, that make up these, these different things. And then we'll essentially deconstruct that apple in our lab. So we have a full food laboratory here in Boston and we'll deconstruct each one of those analytes. So we'll look and test for vitamin C and moisture and sugar and whatever else we deem important. And we'll do that until we're satisfied that, hey, we know what apples look like from many different directions. And we'll do hundreds and hundreds of samples of that, just like any other food lab would do. And you would do that with one type of apple or with all the different ones? It depends. So with apples, we have to do multiple varieties. In the case of blueberries and spinach, what we found so far is that you'd actually... Blueberry is a blueberry for the most part, whether it's grown in Maine here in the U.S. or Chile or in Spain. For the most part, a blueberry model works regardless of where it's grown. For apples, 
there's a lot of variability in the different types of uh, cultivars. And so for apples, we have to get very specific for Braeburn or for Gala or for Fuji. And grapes, you'd have a green grape model and you'd have a red grape model. So it, it all depends on the type of food. So once we've done the lab work, which is the part that most technology companies want to skip because that's the hard part and the time-consuming part, but we've done a deep dive now on apples, we take all that information and we essentially create a digital data model. So we digitize that information and we say, okay, we create two models. The first model is a classifier model, and that's the easy one. So we say, okay, now based on all these different factors, we build a model that says, I'm going to take a handheld spectrometer off the shelf. So lots of companies make these things. And when I scan a piece of food, using that classifier model, I'll be able to determine without telling that device anything that, hey, this is an apple. If I've successfully done that, then it goes to the next model, which is a predictive model that says, okay, now that I know it's an apple, I'm going to look at all the different things that we're measuring. I'm going to look at the moisture content and vitamin C and sugars and so on. And I'm going to make a prediction of the levels of those analytes inside of that particular apple. And I'm going to return to you individual scores of each one of those analytes. And I'm going to give you a combined score that says, here's the overall quality of that particular apple. So not apples in general, not the concept of an apple, but that actual apple in your hand. And that does it based on the spectrometer data that's getting out of the, the off-the-shelf device that you, that you use. That's right. So we take a, a high-fidelity lab model and we basically dumb it down, if you will, to a model that works on a, a field device. So you've essentially taken a, a low-cost device that you know is out in the field, whether it's on a farm or a retail store or you know, ultimately maybe a consumer's hand, and you've made it as powerful as a spectrometer and other devices that normally you would only find in a laboratory. And what does it serve, let's say me as a, um, let's say I'm Tesco or a giant food uh, retailer. Why would I want to know, I mean, why would I want to know that it's an apple? Probably I can tell by myself, but especially the second part, what, what does it help me to do my job better? Well, so today, you know, if lots of applications. So if I'm a retailer or if I'm anywhere in the supply chain, there is, regardless of how sophisticated the company is, so whether I'm Amazon on the far end of sophistication or I'm an average retailer on the low end of sophistication, I essentially use the same methods to determine quality. I'll receive a shipment of apples or peaches or whatever, and I go through a very rudimentary, archaic way of determining, is this what I ordered? I maybe taste it, I smell it, I'll do some bricks testing, I'll feel it, you know, I'll they'll tell me how old it is, I'll know what region it's from, what farm it's from. But it's art, it's not science. And so if you think about that, now I'm now the front lines of Tesco, to use your example, for this multi-billion dollar retailer, and I'm using these archaic ways of determining quality, and then it enters into my system, and I have to get it through that system and to you as a consumer as fresh and as high quality as possible. Well, in reality, I have no idea what I just received, and therefore I have no idea what I'm in turn selling you. And so when you actually take this technology that we developed and you scan that apple, you find out that it is oftentimes 25 or 50x off of what the nutritional label says should be there. Wow, that's a lot. And we just assumed that the retailers knew that. And of course, as entrepreneurs, we're thinking, okay, well, hey, you know, the proverbial man is out to get us as consumers. And then we quickly realized they had no idea. This was news to the retailer. So people that have been in the industry their entire careers and have bought billions and billions of dollars or pounds or euros worth of produce or meat or anything else have truly no idea what they're actually buying and putting into their own supply chains. So the nutrition value could be so much lower or high, no, higher, probably not, as what your model would predict and say in this apple or in this piece of meat, there should be X, Y, Z. And you see that there's absolutely nothing even near to that. It leads to a very interesting conversation with the supplier, I can imagine. Well, that's right. And so that's the other side. So now you're thinking, okay, well, hey, then now this is going to be a, a tool that retailers are going to use to beat up suppliers. But in reality, this is also a great tool for farmers and suppliers because they didn't know either. And now if you have this tool in the field, you instead of saying, look, I'm going to, I'm just going to hedge, I'm going to harvest all my apples, and then I'm going to come up with some blended price and throw away the ones that look terrible or I know are bad and kind of give you a blended price. But now if I can start to actually sort of dynamically assess each one of these and say, well, you know what, these are actually 
tens out of tens and hey these are mid-range quality and so on and so on i might be able as a farmer to you know to get a better price or i may actually be able to use this technology which we've seen in some pilots to harvest differently so maybe i need to harvest these apples a little bit earlier or a little bit later or maybe do something different because the technology is so mobile and you can do it while the, the apples are still on the tree or the the food is still on the ground you can actually start to make different decisions before harvest which completely changes. I mean, it, it gets to that question you actually ask on, on the website. So how is food changing through the supply chain? And especially how is the quality of food changing through the supply chain? Especially as many products are being harvested, maybe not ready or not at top quality. And then we sort of bring them through the whole chain to, to get to the local supermarket, to get to the local shop. And they're, they've basically changed as a product. And with this, you can, you can follow and see, okay, where is the quality really going down and how can I intervene with that? That's right. So we did a pilot with Tesco actually in Asia a while back where they were shipping grapes from Chile to their operations in Thailand, the retail stores in Thailand. And they were wasting, I think it was upwards of a million dollars a month in grapes because, of course, by the time they arrived from Chile, which is a huge shipment time, most of the shipments were spoiled. And so now with a technology like this, you can actually assess the quality before they leave the shipping point and make a determination to say, you know what, these grapes will never make it all the way to Thailand. It's a whatever, 32-day trip, and these grapes aren't going to survive 32 days. So you can pick the ones that might survive that, or you can ship them differently to Thailand, or you can ship them somewhere else. And so as a result of doing that, they greatly reduce waste and you know, we're able to sort of dynamically route food from the port of origin. And what's the most surprising, there are probably many stories here, maybe I open a Pandora box, but what's the most surprising moment you've had in working with this quality focused, but still very mobile, let's say handheld devices, plus obviously the models? I think the, the biggest surprise, well, there's two. One is I, I sort of touched on a second ago, and that is that those in the supply chains, the so-called experts had no idea that this existed out there. And I think everyone sort of understood, yes, of course, over time, an apple degrades, but I don't think anyone realized that it degrades in a matter of weeks. So if you think about apple season as September and October, for the most part, and at least in the parts of the world that we live in, after about six weeks, that apple doesn't have any nutrition left in it. It's essentially sugar and, and water. So, sorry, if, if, even if it's stored in all the, they claim, optimal circumstances, and I'm eating, uh, let's say it's, uh, it's September now, actually, I'm eating it from basically the year before, nutritionally, it's pretty much dead. Yep. It doesn't matter how you store it. So regardless wow. of whether it's stored in MCP1, which is the suspended state that they keep apples in, or frozen, if you freeze it, hey, for the most, you know, not apples, of course, but other foods, it, it may slow the degrade, uh, degradation down, but but ultimately it, it happens. So if you're eating apples in January or February or certainly the spring and summer, hey, it's it's better than a Snickers bar, but essentially it's a it's a sugar, sugar bar. Bomb, yeah. Yep. So that that was a, a surprise. The second surprise, though, is that price means nothing. So regardless of how much I'm paying for this. As a consumer, essentially that price doesn't equate quality. So even if I'm going to a higher end retailer or buying at a farmer's market or maybe buying organic versus conventional from a nutritional standpoint, so forget the environmental footprint for a minute, there are really no differences. So if I go to a particular market, say London or Boston or we're at, and I look at apples right now, or right now is not a good time because it's kind of a blend of in season and out of season. Let's say in July, I looked at apples. Apples essentially are bad everywhere in July or February in a market. Yeah, because if you find them at a farmer's market, it means they've been stored yeah, as well. That's right. But as a consumer, I'm thinking, well, but there's vast differences in the pricing of that. So I think that's where you start to as realize, well, I'm buying a story, which, hey, in some cases, that's okay. Sometimes I like buying a story, but I want to know about that. I want to know that if I'm buying an apple and I'm paying four ninety nine for that apple in July, I want to know that why I'm paying $4.99 for it. I like the retailer. I like the experience. Maybe it's extra sweet or whatever, but I don't want to believe that that $4.99 apple has the same nutrition as it does in October when it's right off of a tree. And so really what we're trying to get to is not, hey, stop eating apples. That's the last thing we want people to hear. It's more about, I just want people to make a, a more informed decision about that apple. So the whole 
discussion around the local gets a whole like a whole new chapter, but especially the discussion around seasonal and being as close to the farm or the producer as possible. Because if you're saying let's stay with apples, it takes a few weeks. It obviously means the the longer the less. I mean, is it a linear? <laughs> like it depends probably how you store it. But is it a linear way down? And literally, like, is if I eat it off the let's say if I eat it off the tree, or if I eat it a few weeks later, it is already a different apple. Well, the answer is yes, but the how do you get to that yes are always a little bit different. In some cases, it's the effects of the supply chain. How is it shipped? You know, how is it stored? You know, temperature, humidity, things like that. In other cases, it's how it was grown. So sticking with the apple example for a minute, in 2017, when we first started this, living in New England, we went around to all the different New England orchards and we picked apples right from a tree. And we would have them back in our lab within the hour. So our team went out there and picked them, put them in the lab, tested them. And as you'd imagine, the, the nutrient contents were off the chart sometimes three, four, five X of what the label said should be in those apples for vitamin C's and antioxidants and things like that. We went to the same orchards in 2018, exact same orchards, some cases the same row of, of trees and picked the apples and took them to the lab within an hour and, and tested them. And we could find almost no hint of vitamin C in the apples. And so, of course, right away we thought, well, we have a, a technology problem. We have broken models or something happened in the lab or whatever. Machine is broken. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, of course, we did it again and we tested things and all the scientists had a, you know, a week and a half of freak out. And we realized, nope, everything works fine. They're just for whatever reason. And the farmer didn't know and we didn't know. But, hey, the same apples or for the apples from the same orchards uh, didn't have any vitamin C right off the tree. And so we looked into, you know, it was a little bit hotter, a little wetter season. But the reality is there was just, there's no historical data to tell you why these apples were less nutritious despite being hours old. So it's really, I mean, we're getting to the, the farmer's level now. And, and obviously with the tree, it's sort of easier because you can go back to the same tree every year. But the management plus, in this case, weather conditions probably fundamentally change the product in the, in the sense that there's some years there's no vitamin C in, in your apple, even if you take it from the tree. That's right. Even if it's fresh off the tree, even if you went to a, you know, you pick orchard and with a family and picked an apple, there's no guarantee. So that was a long answer to, that was shocking for us to learn that. You just assumed, hey, if I pick an apple off a tree, it doesn't get any fresher and any more nutritious than that. And where did you go from there? Because it also sort of is, is such a big thing when you discover that, like basically anything you see in the supermarket, you have no idea what's in it, even if you look at the label. And even if you pick it yourself, there's still like zero guarantee that you get the nutritional values you want. Did it make you very pessimistic or what was the next step after that in, in terms of, of Teak Origin and your work? Well, I think it, you know, it's, I'd be lying if I said it wasn't a little discouraging, but at the same time, you're thinking you can't fix a problem, right? And, and this is the, to me, bigger topic we can get into someday about the food system. We pretend like we're fixing it, but you're, it's hard to fix problems until you sort of face into reality. And so even though personally it was a little discouraging as a consumer, you're thinking, okay, well, at least now we're starting to get to some ground truth so we can start to then rebuild and figure out, okay, well, now we know this about apples and something else, spinach, for example, hey, we learned it was seven days. After seven days, all the nutrients are essentially gone from spinach, regardless of how it's shipped or stored. Including frozen. Including frozen, yep. So where we went is we said, okay, look, we're going to start with produce. So essentially the technology that we've created does three things. One is it determines quality, let's say nutritional quality or nutritional contents. The second thing it does is identifies adulteration. And then the third thing is authentication. So, hey, is this truly Atlantic caught salmon or is it farmed salmon or is this Cabernet Sauvignon from this particular vineyard or, or not? Or is this, you know, wheat from a particular farm or has this milk been adulterated or has this olive oil been adulterated? I mean, all the ones you mentioned now, are, I think the ones where there's an incredible amount of fraud and an incredible amount of, of changes happening. Yeah, so they're, they're probably good places to start. Yeah. So, but then we said, okay, well, let's start where we think we can have the largest impact. You know, each one of those, of course, is massive impact, but let's start where we kind of have some, some critical mass. And so we said, let's, let's finish off this produce thing because apples were just kind of a place we started and 
the time of year we actually started Teak Origin, it just sort of worked out where, you know, hey, apples, we were coming into apple season. So just in terms of impact, because I think it's interesting for investors to go through that process as well. So you see this basically like the curtain is being pulled away and you suddenly see that everything you've been eating and working on, you don't know, and you, you've developed this technology to actually start knowing more of that. And you decided to not focus on, on olive oil, uh, not focus on wine, which could have been very interesting from <laughs> different perspectives. But you say that the most impact we can make is in produce. Can you explain a bit why you, you thought that and decided because you had to focus and you couldn't do all of it, obviously, not only because you started in Apples, but I think there's, there's more reason behind it. Yeah. So what we've done now is we've created essentially models for the top, call it 12 produce items, which represent about 60% of the fresh produce market. And the idea there is, hey, quality is something that's much easier to impact because of sort of two things. One is on the supply chain side of things, the example I gave about grapes at Tesco and, you know, getting things through the supply chain faster or more efficiently, we feel like we could, we could influence or affect change there quickly and start to, you know, have a positive impact. Secondly, on sort of the more anecdotal side of things, everyone we told this story to, and we've told it to thousands now over the years about sort of the peak origin concept, the thing that sort of resonated the most with people were simple things like the apple story. I didn't realize that if I wanted to get the vitamin C equivalent of an apple, in some cases, I'd have to eat 25 apples to get that vitamin C. And so people could relate to that. It wasn't talking about farm caught salmon and Atlantic caught salmon. Hey, some people care about that. Some people don't know what you're talking about. Hey, some people don't care about whether my wine is real or not. But everyone related to the apple story. Everyone related to leafy greens and spinach or you know, produce and, and, and freshness. And so we thought that was just a good place to start from both a consumer standpoint to get them sort of aware of this and starting to question and think about their food and for the supply chain to, to jump into action. And probably there's an enormous amount of waste in terms of freshness and not freshness anymore, like you mentioned with the grapes. Like, I mean, wine can stay a bit longer and, and olive oil and maybe cold salmon if it's frozen. But everything else, I mean, especially in the produce aisle, is, uh, I mean, a lot of that never gets sold for, for different reasons and thrown away. Yeah. That's right. That's exactly right. And we kind of made a, a decision and it was a tough one because, hey, we're entrepreneurs. But we said, if we could get the retailers on board with this, they... The downside of that is, hey, they're difficult to work with and they're not exactly forward thinkers and they don't move quickly and they don't adopt technology. But you need a client because you already excluded consumers as potential clients. And, and yeah, you need it. You needed a, a client with access to the full supply chain and, and be able to measure quality at the port in Chile of grapes, but also in Thailand and how they actually arrive. Yeah. That's exactly right. You needed someone with scale that has the ability to sort of push back into the supply chain and affect change and someone who then can in turn reach the consumers, a large amount of consumers and say, okay, hey, we've now made, we now made improvements. And so you can get better food to people, or at least you can encourage better food decisions to more people faster. And so that's where we decided to start with this technology is sort of, you know, with the retailers, knowing that it wasn't necessarily the easiest decision, but wasn't going to make your life easier, but yeah. Yeah, but but that's where we thought we could have the, the biggest impact. That's right. And, I mean, it's absolutely fascinating. Have you seen, I mean, we're, we're you mentioned the spinach and, and the other produce you're, you're working on. In terms of management of soil, I think, to get back to the podcast and regenerative agriculture, have you seen anything there? I mean, you mentioned organic versus non-organic. Does not make any difference if you look at the nutrition value? Because in July, both of them are bad anyway, if you consider apples in, in our area of the world. What have you seen in terms of management? What have you seen in terms of the farms you maybe have visited? What have you seen there? And is there like this, this holy connection that everybody talks about of healthy soils and healthy produce and thus healthy gut? What have you seen there? Well, so I'll say first that we haven't done a lot of looking into specific changes or practices on a, a farm. In fact, I think you're going to be seeing him in a few weeks, uh, David Montgomery. And we actually have had a number of conversations with him where we're actually going to work alongside David and his wife to do some studies on, mm, you know, different types of practices. So, hey, here's a, a farm that's practicing regenerative agriculture and here's one that's not. And what are the differences? So side by side comparisons. That would be amazing because he's br they're bringing out a book. That's right. Him and his yep. wife, right? Yeah. Specifically on this connection. Yeah. Cool. I had him on the show 
two years ago, maybe, on Growing a Revolution, like the current book on, on, on his journey in regenerative health. Well, that's how we ended up talking. So he was uh, speaking at a, an event that I was at recently, and he said, hey, I'm having a difficult time writing my latest book because I can't get access. There's no data out there. And so I'm trying to prove, hey, that this regenerative agriculture is better or it produces better food, but I can't find any data to support that. And so then we started talking and anyway. But I will say this, that what we have been able to prove is I can tell the difference. So as I build this model up, and again, it seems like we're sticking with apples. So as I build the apple model up. You can choose any other to crop, but apples are, are apparently, I mean, from all your conversations, it's such an easy, something that everybody probably eats every now and then. Yeah, That's right. Exactly. Everyone knows the apple, right? Apple a day. As I build the, the apple model, if I know the orchard that it came from, then we have a 96% accuracy in predicting the farm or the orchard where it came from. So if I know that farm A is using a very specific type of practice or doing something specific with its soil and farm B is not or they're doing something different, now as a buyer, whether I'm a consumer or a, a supply chain customer, and I want to prove that, hey, these apples or this wheat or whatever it is is coming from farm A that's using these type of practices, I can at least validate that. Because the challenge today, I think, from what I understand in the supply chain and the time I've spent in it, is all the farms are, you know, a lot of farmers are trying to do the right thing and do better things and investing in regenerative agriculture. But once it hits the supply chain, then things are just called food or they're just called apples or it's just called grain. And so it's really difficult to differentiate between the different growing practices. And so at least we're not the end-all, be-all solution, but we're a solution that you're able to say, okay, hey, I know I can prove that this came from from this farmer that they're, that are doing these the, the right things. Yeah, I can. I, I think you see it. A lot of farmers almost are pushed into selling directly because the market and the commodity market just doesn't value quality. And, and if they've done all the work, like you said, they invested, they spent a lot of time building their soil, and the market just pays the commodity price. It, it sort of doesn't make sense. And you see a lot of them actually go trying to go directly. But of course, if you have a scale, and probably that's been limiting, has been limiting the regen egg movement that besides if you're too big basically to go to the farmer's market every uh, Saturday to sell your stuff, then you sort of are left out of this movement so far. And you see now some big retailers or some big food producers actually start to look more and more into quality because of, of products like uh, and technologies like yourself. And because there hasn't been any focus or any demand or any moment that basically retailers or suppliers could actually ask for a certain kind of, of quality and then could actually test if you could actually do that unless going to a lab which is extremely expensive and probably too far from any farm to do so i think that has been limiting the regenic movement for a long time as you could do small scale and sell direct which is great but if you do a thousand acre or a thousand hectare farm it gets into a whole different you need to sell a lot of direct things to make that work i think that's right on i agree with you 100 percent and so what are you working on? Like it's now September, 2019. What are you working on now? What are you most excited about? If you can share that, obviously, in terms of, of t coercion. Yeah. So for the last two years, we've you know been really focused on just making the science work. It was important for us to have the scientific community behind us. And it was important for us to get this right and sort of be in not stealth mode, I hate that term, but just very quiet about what we were doing. We conducted a number of pilots in the supply chain with, but we just wanted to get it right. And so now we feel comfortable and, you know, hey, our scientists will say, you know, you'll never get it 100%, but we're at a point now we're ready to share it with the world. So in January of 2020, we're launching what we call the Food Quality Index. And essentially it's these top 12 produce items that we are now out basically scanning them in, in a, uh, multiple markets and when I say scanning, we're just buying them as consumers would buy these foods. So you think about grapes and avocados and apples and blueberries and strawberries and spinach and bananas, all the, the, the common stuff that regardless of where you live are the, the staples, if you will. And we're buying those as consumers and at multiple retailers at all different price points. And we're just creating this massive data set. And in January, we'll share this with consumers in a couple of different markets so they can start to interact with this data just to say, wow, you know, did you know this? And it's not meant to say, hey, don't shop at retailer A or did you know retailer B? It's it's not that at all. It's sort of putting the user at the center of this and just saying, hey, this is something that you may or may not be aware of or you may not even care about, but did you know? Simultaneously to that, we are working on some major retail pilots 
that are building the business case up to say, well, this is not just about dropping a grenade into the marketplace and saying, hey, good luck with that retailer. Go everyone for themselves. We're saying, okay, now we want to share this information with consumers because we think as consumers we deserve it. But in addition to that, we're building this use case or this business case with these retailers to say, but we're also fixing the problem. So it's possible for retailers and producers to bring you solutions to these problems that you may or may not know you've ever had. So that is coming in January. So now we're just collecting data. We're actually building the technology platform and and working on these pilots with uh, some of our retail partners. That's a very, very busy time, I can imagine. It is, yeah. It's exciting because we've, we're getting out of that R&D mode and spending all our time in the lab, and now we're interacting with the world, which is both exciting and you know, scary as hell. And what do you see in terms of when you look at quality in the supply chain and the food system? What are the biggest barriers so far? I mean, you mentioned it's it's impossible to measure. Do you think it's the... Do you think the consumer would be willing to pay for quality as well? I mean, we sort of already doing that because we think organic or we think X, Y, Z is better. But what do you see as the biggest barriers beyond the technology platform, beyond knowing what is quality? Because we seem to have, or at least are on the way of fixing that. What are other big barriers that, that you're working on or worried about or other things we as a, as a sector have to fix? It's always that unknown, right? I mean, it you know, you you've worked on something for so long, you're thinking, okay, well, this you know, has to be relevant and and useful, but the reality is, we may share it with consumers, and people say, hey, who cares? I don't think that's the case because we've done some homework, but there's always that risk of that. I think the one of the biggest hurdles in the supply chain is time. So if you look at some of the retailers today, and I guess I'll use names. So like Aldi, for example, or Walmart, or some of the the retailers that are high volume and uh, Walmart you know, turns things over very quickly. And Aldi, they source their produce very opportunistically. Hey, this week I need X number of pallets or truckloads or whatever of food. I'm going to buy it, put it on my shelf. When it's gone, it's gone. I'm going to next week I'll buy something different. I don't know their policies, so maybe they have much more stringent policies than their peers. My gut tells me they don't. My gut tells me that their quality tends to be better than their peers, and I think it's because they're moving things through very quickly. Whereas on the high end of things, if you take a Whole Foods in the U.S. or like a Waitrose in the U.K., their quality tends to be not as good. And I think it's not because they have lower standards or they're doing anything different other than they're just not moving food through the, the supply chain as quickly. So I don't know how to solve that problem at Whole Foods or a Waitrose, but I do know that we have enough data now that says if you can get things moving through quicker than you know, common sense says because quality only lasts so long, you're going to have higher quality at, at, in the store or at the consumer end of things. That's extremely interesting. I mean, it triggers two thoughts. One, let's hope we're not starting flying everything to get it as fast as possible from Chile to, to Thailand in, in the case of grapes or, or anything else. And two, probably there will be some let's say, movements around how to store things differently. Well, until now, it seems like that had no impact whatsoever. But with technology like this, probably you can you can start actually measuring, like, does this peel have a certain effect? Does this gas, et cetera, et cetera? And maybe it starts looking at the management of the farms or the producers. But it's interesting that time is such an important factor. And we, we often, I don't think, consider it enough to, especially around produce. Well, and you said a key thing. We, you know, we, we definitely don't want to be flying precious food all over the world. So the three things that we're measuring and we'll be reporting to consumers, of course, to retailers as well. One is you know, the actual quality, which we've been talking about. The second one is price. And then the third thing are miles. So how far did this food have to come? To get here and so if you start to look at that from a consumer spect- perspective you think okay well but but also the way of transport in that or just the distance if we know it but we don't always know because yeah, right you now you cannot see it probably yeah, yeah we can't does that's, the pressure like of a plane have a different effect that could be interesting that's right but it, it, at first it's just information that the the consumer can start to contextualize so if i think okay look i'm shopping at a high-end retailer and i see the quality score is 60 out of 100 so maybe okay but it's not fantastic and then i can see well hey but the price is high and hey in order to get that 60 i've had to maybe it's local maybe that it came 25 miles away so okay that starts to align with my values and i get that or you say hey well maybe there's a a 77 out of 100 in terms of quality 
hey, the price is much lower, but it had to come 7,000 miles to me. So again, this is all a test, but as a consumer, you can start to at least understand a little bit more about your food because today it's a given. If I grab an apple, I assume that whatever the label says, regardless of where it's from, it is what it is. And we just want to start to change that dynamic and change that thinking to get you, you know, your mind around this a little bit more. And until that happens, it's really hard to drive or to introduce change. Yeah, and you, you might even get like uh, the apples of this year, like we mentioned before, have an extremely high vitamin C. You almost get a bit of wine, wine talk around this year has been a really good year for apples, not just in terms of quantity, but actually in terms of quality. Yeah, that's right. And you think about what this could do for local, because local has always sort of been this fringe thing and for lots of there's other challenges but in the case of spinach which i mentioned earlier so the reality with spinach and when i say spinach is really leafy greens if you want to eat those for their nutrient contents then you're going to have to grow it closer to where they're consumed period you're not going to be able to get leafy greens and spinach from the fields in southern mexico to europe or to the east coast of the united states in time for them to have any material nutrient contents so now all of a sudden you start to build business cases around having to grow these type of foods closer to where they're consumed or getting your mind around seasonality to what you had mentioned earlier. You know, you think about what, what is it now, three generations maybe that have no idea about seasonality of food, right? I mean, I think we're, I know I'm old enough anyway to remember, hey, there was a cherry season and a watermelon season. And nowadays that it, it's a concept on my teenage kids. They have no idea what I'm talking about. Yeah, and I think it gets to price as well. Everybody's always talking about it. it's too expensive to buy good quality. I mean, we don't even know what good quality is. But let's say we, in a year from now, we know, and, and it's it's open and, and everybody can tell. But then suddenly, if you have to eat 25 apples to get to the same level of the other apple that you could also buy, suddenly the whole price difference of a few percent of even 10 or 20% doesn't really matter if you're going for nutrients. But I, I think healthcare will be a very important point there, but we need to know before before unlocking that. But then suddenly the price discussion becomes a completely different, becomes nutrients per euro or per dollar or nutrients per pound. And it's very interesting, very scary for, I think, anybody in the food system, but also very interesting from especially people semi out like we are. Well, it, it, it's funny because um, we've been doing these interviews and I think about you know three dozen interviews now with retail executives from around the world as we were developing this user experience for our uh, platform. And, you know, these represent producers and retailers from all around the world. And when you talk to them, we call it the split screen effect. So when you're telling about this, we're having a conversation similar to the one we're having now. When they put their individual or their consumer hat on, they're very interested in this. Wow, I want this, or I wish I had this, or my wife, or, you know, my family. This would be very useful. I could see how I would use this at home. And then something you said just triggered this thought. But then they sort of say, well, wait a minute. And they put their, their day job hat back on and they say, well, you can't communicate price. That's not right. And hey, you can't. You know, This is dangerous to be able to communicate this to public, just sharing quality information. And, and it's like it's funny to see this sort of Jekyll and Hyde thing happening in their minds. You know, they just it's this traditional mindset of being in the supply chain. And then there's this like, oh, wait a minute, but I'm also a consumer, too. So it's. It's happened, I think, in 100% of the, the conversations we've had so far. And is that difficult because some of these are your clients? And do you get tension there as well? Like transparency is great, but only to a certain extent? For sure. And so part of the reason why we've decided to kind of take this dual approach, hey, let's share this in a very measured, in a very constrained way with consumers, is that these same retailers and these clients have admitted they sort of need that nudge. It's not going to be enough for one of their peers to adopt this technology and then, you know, sort of all the dominoes fall. They're going to need the tension. You know, retailers tend to make changes when their customers demand change. And so I think as much as they sort of resist it and don't necessarily like it, they also get it. And tell their customers sort of say, well, wait a minute, I looked at this week's results from the food quality index and I see that, hey, you're not doing so great. And that's going to drive change. And at the same time, the retailer is going to come from the other direction to say, well, hey, guess what? We've been working on our avocado problem or we've been working on our blueberry problem. And so it's never going to perfectly meet in the middle, but we have to take this sort of dual approach. Yeah, I think it makes a lot of sense. I, I want to be conscious of your time. I think there's so much more to cover, but I want to end with a few questions I, I usually ask. And one of that is, it's inspired by, by John Kemp, who I interviewed before. I was doing a lot of work on, on actually fruit quite a bit. And 
what do you believe to be true about modern agriculture? Could also be regen agriculture, would you prefer, that others don't believe to be true? I think the scientific worldview is no substitute for human life. I don't want food, regenerative agriculture, or, or the modernization of the food system to make the same mistakes that we've made with climate change and, and other things. If we can't find a way for the masses to understand what this means to me, what does this change? And if you go to a regenerative agriculture conference, you know, hey, there's 150 different definitions of what it is, and this grass-fed, and it's organic and permaculture and whatever, and you get that across all sort of the... The, the food system these days, everyone's driving change. But if we can't easily translate to what it means to an individual consumer or you know the, the everyday person, then I think this is going to remain on the fringe. And I think we're going to be struggling with this for decades to come, which I think we both agree we can't afford for that to happen. So I think, you know, what we're trying to do is just one small, tiny little piece of it. But I think what we all have to try to do together, much more collectively, is find a way to relate all the work that we're doing to the individual so that they can make better choices in their lives. That's why I'm interested in the nutrient density of, of food and the connection to healthy soil is that it, it touches you and your children directly, like what you eat and how that's being grown. And we're, we're going to wait for a lot of results with David, David Montgomery, but there, there is some, you see already in some mostly anecdotal evidence, but that connection, if that's such a strong connection, it would be even if you don't care about climate change, even if you care about drought, if you don't care about agriculture in general, you care about health, or at least you, you sort of care about you and your children, most people. And, and that could trigger, uh, unlock a lot of demand for people that are, are growing nutrient-dense food in a different way. I think that's spot on. I think that's right. And it might answer actually the question I'm, I'm asking now, but if you could change one thing overnight, if you could wave a magic wand and tomorrow morning we wake up, and Greg has changed something, what, what would it be in the food system? Could also be in general, but let's stick to it. Oh, <laughs> I was going to say, uh, yeah, again. I, I think, oh boy, if I could wave a magic wand, it would be for all of us to have the tools and the desire to understand what we're putting in our bodies, how it affects our health, and how those decisions reverberate across our communities and our planet. And I say tools because they don't exist, but also the desire, which doesn't always exist. So I think those are two, as we were sort of joking beforehand, two giant mountains that we still have to climb. And I see those as two different mountains, creating that desire and building the tools. Yeah, we were joking before, before the interview, we were in the food system. And the more you know, the more difficult it is, and the more you see actually that it has to change. And it seems like we're climbing a mountain, and the mountain keeps growing. We don't even see the size. And the stone we're pushing up keeps getting bigger as well and it starts to snow etc but it's a fun interesting and very very rewarding at least for me I can only speak for me right so far but yeah there probably even be two mountains here the ones you're describing now yes i agree it's it, it, it's maddening and it's rewarding at the same time and i can't imagine doing anything different with my life however long that might be I cannot imagine a better way to finish the the interview. I think it was extremely interesting. I wish you a lot of luck launching this in, in January. I think it's going to create the shock wave, maybe not through a hand grenade, maybe through a stone in a pond, but it's going to probably pull the curtain of a lot of things we, we thought we knew about food and we actually don't. So thank you for your time, for your hard work, and uh, I'll definitely be checking in probably soon after the launch and see how things are going. And of course, follow the work with David. Oh, thank you so much, Cohen. I really appreciate your time and uh, letting me have the opportunity to talk about what we're doing. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed this interview and learned something about the immense opportunities when focusing on real measurable quality. If you found the Investing in Regenerative Agriculture and Food podcast valuable, there are a few simple ways you can use to support it. Number one, rate and review the podcast on your podcast app. That's the best way for other listeners to find the podcast and it only takes a few seconds. Number two, Share this podcast on social media or email it to your friends and colleagues. Number three, if this podcast has been of value to you and if you have the means, please join my Patreon community to help grow this platform and allow me to take it further. You can find all the details on patreon.com slash regenerative agriculture or in the description below. Thank you so much and see you at the next podcast.